I, I know my friend, um, uh, some people who are close friends with me who, are, who died in that uh, situation in Tigray. I know some families who are dead. Uh, and I see corpse lying on the streets in Magala, literally in Magala. And uh, he was just saying that no civilian will target, no one will be there. The, the, that was the saddest thing to hear about it. A full-fledged war was what, what was happening in Tigray. And he, for the first time in the world, after a war, after a complete genocide, uh, is made in Tigray. He was the first one to say after <laughs> no one was dead. Thousand, I'm not talking about the soldiers who, are, who died fighting. I'm talking about civilians. More than 50 to 1,000 civilians are killed in Aksum. There was a massacre in Aksum, uh, in Tigray region. The, almost 800 people uh, dead in a single day. And their corpus, their corpus were placed for display on the streets, basically. And I'm saying this, it's not, it's not a propaganda, or it's not, I'm, I'm not just simply guessing about this. There were people, my friends, my colleagues in Aksum University, who were killed simply because they are Tigrayans, who were targeted and who, whose corpse was displayed for, 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 for psychological warfare out there in the street, basically. No one can go to Aksum and can count the graves in Aksum, in Marantio. Uh, they, 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 their graves were in Aksum, Marantio. So you can, you can go there and you can count. Everyone can talk about it now because the, the communication was back and because there was a brief uh, transportation w w w which was allowed. There are some videos, literal genocide videos provide, provided in the internet, they are in the social media. So you can see them, I can provide it to you basically. There are a lot of videos which are coming out. If the internet are back again, you can see a lot of uh, atrocities in Tigray. Even a, even if, if in a normal nightclub fighting, people die because it's just simple fighting basically. What's happening in Tigray is a war, full fledged war. They use whatever necessary, they use the air force, they use army rates, drones. For me, we were killed out there basically. But he was denying every single person uh, was not targeted or attacked basically. If he had even a little bit of uh, mercy, I hope he considers that uh, the, ge the genocide happened in Integrae will inevitably, in his government, uh, like in the in 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 future to come, basically. But I wish if he had the chance to talk with himself, with, with the people of Tigray, that uh, he stops the, this genocide uh, orchestrated by himself and uh, by the Eritrean government, basically. That's what I have to say. I need my people to be safe. I need my family to be safe. I need to stop this genocide, in, which is happening in Tigray. I wish that happened. But I know that they are committed to, to kill my people. Basically. To my sister, really, that I should, before I go public, I should talk to my family right now. But I can't, I, even I can't warn them uh, to hide themselves or to do whatever they do necessary because I'm talking publicly right now. I have no access. So they know the, the provisional government who are in the provisional government, the people. They know my family. They know where they live, basically. But I think they will target them. Uh, but I guess that will not be different from what's happening on all the grand people, basically. Literally, everyone is being targeted whether he speak or not. So that's the risk that I'm willing, that I'm willing to take. To just have access to Magala, basically. Only in Magala, that banking system was open briefly in Magala only. So people were coming to that, and uh, the, the situation was worst. And there is still heavy fighting around Magala till yesterday. And there are, people are being killed because they are, uh, that because they passed through the curfew, even 15, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, that there are extra judicial killings. That people come to their home at night and uh, search their house, basically. 
That's the situation happening in Tibet right now. Almost similar, for, 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 almost similar with the past three months where I have seen by myself out there, without having any political affiliation whatsoever. The Belzegna, which is called Pro Transporty Party in Ethiopia, which is the governing party right now, also asked me before, even before the war, to join their party uh, in Tigray. There is the so called Belzegna or Pro Transporty Party in Tigray. Mm -hmm. But I refused to join them after the hate of Mabel after the war. They also asked me to join uh, in um, the provisional government. But I, uh, because I'm participating in civil society, I was not willing to join them, so I declined. Uh, I had the hopes that I could help my people uh, via uh, humanitarian agenda, even here in the, right now, right this moment. But the conscience condition, the doesn't allow you to do so. So the Eritrean forces out there, the Ethiopian military force out there, are using starvation as a weapon. They are using rape as a psychological warfare, basically. Uh, an estimate can be made. More than 2,000 or 3,000 women are raped in Tigray. More than 50 to civilians are dead. Even the, po the coalition, political party coalition, has made a press release before two or three weeks, I guess. The, the estimation out there was more than 50 to 1,000 uh, civilians were killed basically within this four months. So I have no any intention joining any political party. My agenda is with, with the people of Tigray. No uh, political affiliation whatsoever. Are you the only one? Uh, I was a lecturer in Atum University. I live in Tigray. Tigray is one of the regional states in Ethiopia. And, uh, Recently, for the past four months, there was a still coin a war in the Tigray region. There is a total blackout. You may not hear about these atrocities in Tigray, but uh, there is a genocide going on in Tigray right now. Basically. And the world doesn't know about it because there is total uh, information blackout out there. So I came here because I risk a uh, few for my life. I was uh, I was advocating for democracy, justice, and equality in Tigray. I was also advocating for the right. people of Tigray for their own self determination and rights. But currently, because Tigrayans held their own election, the Tigray government has uh, waged war upon the people of Tigray, and uh, also the government invited Somalian uh, forces and Eritrean forces to join them on this genocide. So th there is a big atrocity and genocide going on in Tigray, which I never thought will happen in the 21st century right now. Almost more than 52,000 people, civilians, uh, killed in Tigray. And uh, so many are out of the country are very few. In Sudan, there are almost more than 70,000 people out there. And uh, there is a big atrocity going on in Tigray, basically. And the um, other person I, I was part of is a civil society called Sabhari, which advocates for the people of Tigray, political, economic, and social rights, basically. Uh, after the, they hailed Mabala, the capital center of Tigray region, uh, some officials on the provisional government uh, asked me to join the provisional government as attorney general of the state, basically, the regional state. I declined because because of what was happening on my people. Uh, th th there is no electricity out there. There is no banking system out there. Uh, there is no internet. Uh, there, even there is no water, basically. The Eritrean forces are killing my people on daily basis. Uh, they, they, they need almost no reason to kill the people. Uh, there is a rampant uh, rape out there, basically. Almost the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission, admitted that uh, there was a rampant rape out there. So many uh, women are uh, women are raped out there. Uh, our properties are looted. Uh, everything what is there in Madala or in the whole Tigray is taken to Eritrea, Asmara. Uh, they almost looted every farmer, uh, basically living in the countryside. My my personal, uh, our personal house is looted and now used as a military camp. 
basically my family are living in horrible condition. Uh, they are living with family and now currently living in a rental house because they cannot access or go back to their home. Uh, because I was fearing for my life, I came here to Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, I thought, and I, I still think that uh, there is a direct risk to my life because I declined their offer to join the provisional government. And I also, uh, uh, I am also currently advocating and also exposing what's happening in Tigray right? because no one is speaking about it in the world right now. Even the United Nations and the European Union are giving a lip service, in fact, but that is not enough. That is not sufficient. Uh, have, uh, 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 taking into consideration what's happening in Tigray, that's a genocide which I never, never thought would happen to my people. Uh, almost we 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 seen it coming, but we never thought, never thought it would be like this. Uh, almost informants is more than 52 civilian people are killed. The fighting is going on right now in Makala, which I live currently. Uh, there is heavy fighting around Makala. Yeah, Tigray. Tigray. Yeah. He has been persecuted, he has been arrested on several locations. 2019, he was arrested. This year, his home was taken over and militarized. As we speak now, he has no home to go to because the, the army, as he will explain himself later on, has taken over his home and converted it into a barracks following the recent events that happened in Ethiopia, where the military invaded his territory. So I welcome you. And please, Africa ought to be a unitarian system to unite all Africans. But because of demarcations and political problems that are facing our continent, we have to come out today and we have to stand with our brothers. And before even I refer to him, we, it's also a lawyer like myself, we would like to thank the President of this country, His Excellency, Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, for having allowed this to happen, for having allowed Kenya to become uh, a bastion human rights. Because initially what was happening in this region is all asylum seekers were, no, were, were actually um, relegated, relegated to non-causes of inhuman and degrading treatment. But for the first time in Kenya's political history, the president has come out very strong to uphold human rights by raising the index of human rights at the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and United Nations Security Council, as well as United Nations Human Rights Center. So Kenya now has become a, a, a hub of human rights defenders, as well as those who are running away from fear of persecution. You can remember during Uchuka's time, the guy who tried to overthrow the government, when he flew for safety in Tanzania, they returned him and executed him. And from that time up to recently, when we did the Lema case, it has been like Kenya's no-go area. If you go, they will return you or they will put you in a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. You can remember the story of uh, Alice Nakwena, who was a woman who was fighting for rights of Ugandan people. But you can see how she was converted into a witch doctor and painted so much in bad light that everybody did not want to associate with Alice Nakwena. She died very miserable in the refugee camp in Kakuma, and that was it. But now, what the president is doing now is what's being done in Europe. I have been an asylum seeker myself. When I went to UK, I got this treatment that I ought to, that ought to have been made to others who came in this country. So we are the first premier law firm in this region to practice immigration law. And as you may see from my biography, I have many degrees, but three more important degrees are uh, two masters of laws in immigration, one from the University of London, SOAS, and one from the University of Baltimore in the US. So I practiced immigration law both in the UK and the US, and currently I'm writing my second PhD in the criminal justice and public policy 